my name is Joel Coron Rios and in this brief video I wanted to tell you a little bit about my book Constituent Power and the Law and also about why I wrote it. In my earlier work on constituent power I noticed two things. First, that the concept of constituent power had a clear juridical relevance. So it was used by courts and government officials in the making of determinations about legal validity and it was also deployed by citizens and commentators in arguments about what kind of institutions we should have. At the same time, constituent power was treated by some scholars as something mystical, as a political concept that perhaps could describe certain types of political acts such as revolutions or the extralegal creation of constitutions, but that was outside of the law, both in terms of law as an institution and of law as an academic discipline. And I thought these two things were not only in tension with each other, but were preventing a proper understanding of the um, concept of constituent um, power. So I decided to write a book that showed the roles that the concept of constituent power um, and the term constituent power itself has played or can play in legal and constitutional discourse. So a book about constituent power and the law. My hypothesis was that constituent power could be used and has been used to support legal arguments directed at limiting the exercise of political power and sometimes used to justify the exercise of political power. The main example of a limit that I had in mind was the doctrine of constitutional, constitutional amendments, where we see courts referring to constituent power as exclusive to the people in order to limit the scope of the amending power. That is to say, courts would say that constitutional amendment proposal amounts to the creation of a new constitution and only the people in the exercise of constituent power can create a new constitution, therefore the amendment is ultra vires, the amending authority. The main example that I had of constituent power justifying the exercise of political power was that of illegally convened constituent assemblies that were declared valid by courts because they were understood as instances in which um, which could be reasonably understood as exercises of constituent power by the people themselves. So for example, you could have a, a constituent assembly triggered by a referendum um, and then comprised by a number of elected delegates that is convened in a way that is contrary to the amendment rule, but the courts say even though this process is contrary to the amendment rule, even though this process looks to be technically illegal, um, it is a valid process because it takes place really outside of the constitutional order and it finds its justification in the idea that the people has constituent power and can adopt a constitution anytime they want, even in violation of a constitution's amendment rule. So these were my two main examples. So, so constituent power as limiting political authority, as in the doctrine of unconstitutional and constitutional amendments, and constituent power as justifying the extra-legal creation of constitutions, as in the case of illegally convened constituent assemblies. But what happened was that in the course of writing the book, I found many other examples, um, some of which have to do um, with institutions that have now been more or less forgotten, such as primary assemblies and the imperative mandate or the idea of constituent instructions, and some examples that actually have to do with the relationship between the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty and the idea of constitutional supremacy. So that is what, what I wanted to do, to write a book about the relationship between constituent power and the law. So after writing an initial chapter about Rousseau, 
um, who does not use the term constituent power, but if you read the book, you will see that that um, he had a very clear distinction between what we call today constituent and constituted power. Um, so, so after writing that initial chapter, what I did was to try to identify the earliest uses and discussions about constituent power, first in the French Revolution, uh, and then from there to just try and identify all discussions I could about constituent power through constitutional history, in, in judgments, in debates, at constituent assemblies, in decrees issued by military juntas, and, and so on. And I was looking at, uh, at, at, at different countries, um, but countries that, um, that of course, operated in that languages I am familiar with. Um, so um, mostly um, Spain, um, Latin American countries, and, and also um, France. So my plan was to identify and classify of these in, all these instances where constituent power um, played the role of um, either um, limiting political power or, or justifying um, political power. But then what happened was that um, in doing that, I started to realize that all these discussions were connected, historically connected, and could be presented in a more or less chronological way. So the project became partly, partly a work in constitutional history since the 18th century, um, or a work in the in the way in which constituent power has been understood through constitutional history, with a particular emphasis um, in France, Spain, and a number of Latin American countries. Moreover, uh, as I was writing the book, I realized that my own views about the nature of constituent power about the relationship between constituent power and sovereignty, and, and also my views about the nature of the power held by a constituent assembly had changed. And this is reflected in the last two chapters of the book, which are really um, constitutional theory chapters that speak to some contemporary debates about the nature of constituent authority. Now, somewhere in these historical or um, theoretical discussions, I think I was able to prove my hypothesis. So I really encourage you to have a look at constituent power and the law. I think that even if you disagree with everything I say uh, here, you will find some interesting things.